Welcome to a Leadership Channel episode on Total Picture brought to you by HR Marketer. Use the link on Peter Bregman's show page to receive a free demo of HR Marketer software and a special subscription offer to the Total Picture radio audience. Peter Bregman began his career teaching leadership on wilderness and mountaineering expeditions before moving into the consulting field with the Hay Group and Accenture. For the last 17 years, he's been the CEO of Bregman Partners, a company which strengthens leadership in people and organizations. Welcome to a Leadership Channel video cast and podcast on Total Picture. I'm your host, Peter Clayton. Peter Bregman's most recent book is titled Four Seconds, All the Time You Need to Stop Counterproductive Habits and Get the Results You Want, published by Harper One. The book is a New York Post top pick for your career in 2015. Peter, welcome to Total Picture. Thanks so much. It's fun to be here. Before we get into a discussion of your new book, I'd like to have you discuss a topic many of the viewers and listeners to this show deal with on a daily basis, which is a very difficult conversation. So I'm going to put you in the shoes of an HR director who has to fire someone, which is like... One of the worst jobs in the world is firing people, right? So, so what what is your what advice can you share? And by the way, this came from I spent uh, quite a bit of time on Peter's uh, website, which is peterbregman.com. Uh, he has lots of videos up there. He uh, he's a regular contributor to Fox Business News. So I uh, I certainly encourage uh, our listeners and viewers to check that out as well. So all right, Peter, what advice can you give to my poor HR director who has to fire someone today? You know the best advice, and I do empathize because firing anybody is a painful experience for both parties. It's not easy on either side, but the best thing you can do is. Do the firing in the first minute or two of the conversation and then have the rest of the conversation. The biggest mistake that we can make is to talk about context and talk about situation and here's what's happening and not actually let someone know why they're in the conversation and they're not really listening to you. They're stressing out. They think they're going to be fired. You haven't told them necessarily. So I say lead with the punchline, meaning put it out there. This is the end. This is not working out for us. And, na- and then you can go on to explain other things, but you've, you've um, detonated the situation a little bit and you've, uh, you've allowed both of you to sit and then actually have a conversation. You let them have the reaction. You can be present to their reaction. I would try to make the conversation pretty short and offer to then have a follow-up conversation if they want to, but the message is clear. It's up front. There That's are no some questions. terrific advice. Um, you know, w- one more topic that that's very prevalent uh, for many of the HR and recruiting leaders I speak with, and, and that's feedback. And you wrote a really interesting blog post on this topic. And I'd like uh, for you to share your advice on how to give feedback and also on how to respond to feedback from your manager or from someone else within your organization. So now I'm going to have to try to remember what I wrote in the blog post, but instead of doing that, I think what I'm going to do is just answer your question and then you can come back to me and let me know if this is what I said in the blog post. Okay. So, you know, feedback in my view is an incredible gift, right? When someone is willing to get over themselves, to get over their own fear of how you're going to respond to them, to get over their own issues in the relationship with you and to share with you something that ultimately can make you more powerful, more effective. That is a huge gift. And so from a receiving standpoint, it's so critical to accept that gift as a gift, to really think of it as a gift. Now, you may feel all sorts of things, right? That's, that's the requirement of leadership, is to feel things, right, and still make the right choices. I run this leadership intensive. It's a four-day really intensive program around leadership. And what I always say about it is, you know, I'm not teaching people new ideas or strategies or processes around leadership that, that people know enough about leadership. They don't fail because of lack of knowledge. They fail because they don't effectively close the gap between what they know and what they end up actually doing, right? That that's the important thing. And so, and that gap is emotional courage, right? We don't do things 
or we respond poorly in situations because we're afraid to feel something. I don't give you feedback because I don't want you to dislike me. I respond defensively to your feedback because I don't want to feel what it feels like to receive poor feedback and feel like I'm not living up to someone else's expectations or my own. And so really the most important thing in leadership is to grow our muscle and our capability in emotional courage so we have the willingness to feel everything. And if we can feel everything, then we can do anything. We are willing to do anything. And so from a leadership standpoint, if you're receiving feedback, to accept it as a gift, to take a breath and really say, wow, this is something I don't, I'm not going to, it's not about whether I agree with it, not about whether I, you know, think they're right. It's about someone's willing, even if they're angry, even if they're critical, even if I don't like them, they're sharing something with me that at the very least is useful data about how I should interact with them. And maybe it's even more than that. Maybe it's data about how I should interact in the world and how I'm perceived more generally. But at the very least, it's how I'm perceived by one person and it's how, and it helps me in terms of how I interact with them. So it's a gift. And the goal is to accept it fully meaning to feel it, to feel whatever it is that you feel, to thank them for it. And you can go ahead and process it somewhere else, right? And think about it later. But to, to really uh, help them and encourage them to continue to give you that kind of feedback because you don't ever have to do anything differently, but you're getting great information. And in terms of giving feedback, one of the things that I say is don't be nice, be helpful, right? Right. Give the gift the way it's going to be useful. Do it skillfully, as skillfully as you can. But if someone's doing something that's not working, you could really um, give them a huge gift, right? By giving them information about what's not working. And uh, I have a little more to say about it, but I'm going to pause here because I've been talking for too long. One of the things you wrote in this blog post specifically was that uh, you had given some feedback to a, a conference organizer and she became very, very defensive and you just kind of dropped it because it was not a situation where it was really appropriate for you to go in depth into that conversation. But I think a lot of people, I mean, the gut reaction is to get defensive, right? Right. Right. No, it's exactly right. I remember that situation very clearly. And I had asked her for feedback and she had given me feedback. And then I said, do you have, and then she said, do you have any feedback for me? And what I learned by the way she responded is I'm not going to give her feedback anymore. It's not worth it for me. It's going to hurt my relationship with her and she's going to get defensive about it and not hear it. So she robbed herself of this great opportunity to learn. And that's an opportunity I never want to rob myself of. Right. Right, but you bring up something else that's very interesting here, and that is the client relationship, which you're always trying to, uh, you know, protect and to strengthen. Right. You know. Right. Right. Yeah. For sure. And you know, there's some people for whom really having that honest conversation strengthens it, and there's some people who, you know, the way I think about it, not to be too harsh, but they're not ready for it. Meaning they they haven't done their own work, so that they have the capacity to listen to stuff that's hard and to take it in. And so if they haven't done that work, you really have to match their capability in some ways. There's something that you wrote on your, uh, on your website that, I, that really resonated with me, and that is what makes leadership hard isn't theoretical, it's practical. It's not about knowing what to say or do. It's about whether you're willing to experience the discomfort, risk, and uncertainty of saying or doing it. So can, can you further expand on this? Because I think this is a real critical element of uh, our conversation today. That's exactly it. I mean, it's the basis of everything that I do and teach, which is that, you know, I, in, in the, I'll bring up the leadership intensive as an example. Again, I started out saying nothing would make me more comfortable and you more comfortable, you being the people who are there. Nothing would make me more comfortable. If I could wax poetic on like what makes a leadership important and I can show you some beautiful PowerPoint and you can write it down and you leave feeling like, wow, there's a lot of value. He taught me a lot. But I can guarantee you nothing will change after that. Nothing. Because everyone's already been to those trainings. Everybody's already learned what it is that they need to know. So the real challenge is can I do things? Not, not can I know what to say? Am I willing to say it? Am I willing to have the uncomfortable conversation? Am I willing to bring up the undiscussable? Am I willing to take a risk? Can I stay grounded in the face of uncertainty or success even or failure and still move forward? 
those are the things that make us successful or fail. I mean, I've seen people careen their careers because they have a failure and then they spiral out of control and they're not able to recover from their own failure. And it's not even the people around them. I saw actually a head of HR in an organization fail in three months and she was in an executive meeting. And in that executive meeting, um, people were asking her questions and she got kind of defensive and she there was this dynamic and it just spiraled. And, you know, the question is, can you recover from that? Of course you can recover from that, but you need to be able to recover from that. No, everyone else can recover from it easily. They're waiting for someone to stand up and say, you know what, you're right, and I said this, and I meant that, and let's start over again. But if you can't ground yourself in that moment, then you're going to be in a downward spiral. You're going to be in a losing streak. So it's so emotional. Well, I think this is an excellent segue to your new book, Get it up here so people can see it. Uh, four seconds, all the time you need to stop counterproductive habits and get the results you want. Um, Peter, your previous book uh, was a Wall Street Journal bestseller titled 18 Minutes, Find Your Focus, Master Distraction, and Get the Right Things Done. Is is four seconds sort of an extension of that book? It is kind of. I'm glad that you asked that question. You know, 18 minutes was about how we structure our days, our lives, our hours so that we can get the right things done, right? It's, I mean, we, we're all overwhelmed and it's about saying, how do I choose the right things and then structure my time and my life so that I accomplish them? Four seconds is about what you do in that time. Meaning I could structure, no, I have to have a conversation and completely flub the conversation or keep avoiding it or take it off my calendar and because I'm afraid of it. And four seconds is about saying, you know, can I act in the moment in a way that helps me move forward productively and effectively in the things that are most important to me. So if 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 you know if 18 minutes was about what you do, four seconds really is about how you do it. Like how you enter into your day and into your relationships and into work and and manage them and master them in a way that's efficient and productive and gets you the outcomes that you're looking for. I've been putting in practice um what what you're writing about and, and and it's really interesting because you know it it's so much of what we're doing today we're under a pressure cooker and and you know t time management and trying to get things accomplished and and instead of you know stopping and taking a deep breath for a minute and considering what you're going to say you just kind of launch into a response to whatever it was that was presented to you yeah we so often react out of the past right do the things we do, you know, we follow the patterns. And those patterns are often very ineffective. They don't work for us, but we don't even stop long enough to see that they're not working for us, right? Because we're just moving so fast. We do that thing, we go to the next thing. We didn't even give ourselves time to pause for a moment and go, did that work or didn't it? Am I getting to my objectives or am I not? And so, you know, four seconds is very much about saying, how do I get to the outcomes that I want, not just act out of the habits, many of which are counterproductive. All right, so let's peel back this onion a little bit. Uh, your book is broken into three parts. Change your mental defaults, strengthen your relationships, and third, optimize your work habits. So let's start with this mental defaults. Uh, what do you mean by this? Well, you know, there are ways which we, in which we think that work against us, and there are things that we do that work against us that have nothing to do with anyone else. You know, I and I, I should start by saying, I um, am not speaking from this perspective of a guru from on up high who, you know, descends my heavenly perch to share my great perfection and wisdom with everyone and then go back up to my perfect life. I struggle with these things all the time. Like I write about the things that I need to learn and that I struggle with. So, you know, using myself as an example, I rush around like crazy. And I'm moving super fast from one thing to the other. And I tell the story in the book of when um, I was writing something and I was kind of stressed out and I was trying to meet a deadline and the wireless internet broke down and it wasn't working and I couldn't try to fix it. You know, and I did everything you're supposed to do when you try to fix it. I yelled at it and, <laughs> right. and you know, kind of hit it on the side and, you know, all the things that my deep technical expertise taught me to do. And then finally I unplugged it and waited a minute right? That's what you're supposed to do. You sort of unplug it and you wait a minute to reset. And in that minute, I, I reset, right? I mean, in that minute, I sort of had nothing to do. I didn't rush off to something else. The internet was blocked for me completely. So I just sat there for a minute and I realized how 
incredible, this idea of like resetting ourselves, that taking a minute, slowing down just long enough to, to ground and to reset ourselves and to move forward. And I was much more effective after that. I plugged it back in and it worked. And so, you know, that's sort of a mental default. We think if we do more and faster and more and faster that we're going to get to where we want to go. And in reality, that often works against us. And it's more about saying, what am I not going to do? And what, what am I going to really focus on? And pausing long enough to identify the outcome that I want to get. You know, what is that outcome? And, and then when I understand what the outcome is, taking the action that's going to get me to the outcome, not the action that I'm just used to taking. And that's a mental default. That's a way of thinking. I mean, I also talk about how we, uh, you know, what, what to do with failure, how to deal with perfection. So many of the ways in which we think work against us. Perfection is a great example. We really tried oftentimes to make things perfect. And the world rewards productivity. It doesn't re reward perfection. You know, if you want to make the best, if you want to be the best host of a podcast, don't spend three months trying to make the perfect podcast. And you're going to tell me if this is right or wrong because you're the expert in this. But if you're going to do that, I would suggest, you know, doing a podcast every single day for three months. One of those at least will be perfect because you will have gotten so much experience. And every time you do it, you probably learn. And so we have to break out of this mindset of making it perfect and into this mindset of doing it a lot. And in doing it a lot, we learn and eventually we get closer to perfection. Of course, perfection is elusive. Exactly. And, you know, to, to the topic of, of podcasting, as I mentioned to you uh, before we started recording this, you know, I've been, I've been doing this show for 10 years, which is like crazy. But starting in December, I started doing more, much more video which is my background, my background is in video production. And my good friend, Bill Cutick, really encouraged me to start doing more video. And, you know, since I've started doing this, my audience has increased, you know, tenfold. I mean, it's, it's really amazing. So you're, you're right. I mean, the more you do this kind of stuff, um, and the more you're willing to experiment with it, you, the better you get and the better results you're going to get. It's great. And you learn every time. And I learn, look, I'm on a high definition camera right now because you told me to get it. <laughs> so like every time I, you know, like I meet people and I learn and I try new things. And am I going to not do this if I didn't have that high definition camera? No, I'm going to do it with what I got. But as I learn, I get better at it. And I, and you know, it, it gets, it gets closer to my ideal of what I'm looking for. So what, one of my favorite titles in your book is why the Pinto blew up. Um, and, and, you know, this sort of gets into goal setting and uh, I think a lot of people really have trouble with this particular topic. Yeah. You know, and, and I've spoken in a lot of interviews about this because people are saying, you know, especially in business shows, they're saying, you know, shouldn't you, shouldn't you set goals? Goals are really, really important. And I'm not completely against goals. Meaning I think that there's some usefulness in creating some goals in some ways, but goals first of all, are overblown and they can get in our way. And I'll give you some examples that, that um, in the Pinto is a great example, right? The Pinto was a car that was developed, I believe it was in 1970, out of a challenge, a goal, a big, you know, BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal by Lee Iacocca. We're going to build a car under 2,000 pounds for under $2,000, right? And I think it was by 1970. And they did. They achieved it. Um, but it blew up every time it was rear-ended or pretty, maybe not every time, but pretty close, right? 53 people died and there were a lot more injuries. So why was that? Well, everyone was so focused on the goal that they bypassed important elements of what they were trying to do. And they bypassed important safety checks that in the end led to a car that was dangerous to own and dangerous to drive. And, you know, there's, I also tell the story in there of a, of a quarterback, New York Jets quarterback who was throwing too many, uh, interceptions. And they wanted him to stop throwing interceptions. So they said, you know, we're going uh, to set a goal for fewer interceptions, reasonable enough, and we're going to penalize you every time you throw an interception. Reasonable when you think about what we do with goals. We're constantly setting goals, and then we set monetary incentives to achieve those goals. Well, he achieved the goal. He, did, he threw many fewer uh, interceptions. But when you look at why, it's because he threw many fewer passes. Right. So his overall performance went down, as did his interceptions. And we all know people who work in business and who, who are entrepreneurs and, you know, they develop their, their businesses and they're super excited and they want it because they want freedom in their lives and they, want, and they want sustainability and they want to be with their families. And, you know, two years later, they've achieved the goals of their business and their business is growing and successful and they have no relationship with their families and they have no time in their lives and they're running ragged in order to keep the thing successful. And, you know, I think we could pursue our goals so single-handedly 
that we forget about why we set them in the first place. So, I mean, I think a goal is okay, but more important than the goal is why am I setting this goal? What am I really trying to achieve? What is the objective? What is the outcome I'm really going for? And that's the thing that we should paste on top of our monitor, you know, or, or above our monitor. You know, it should be, I want, I want freedom and I want to do great work with the people that I work with or with my clients or an amazing product. And I really want to be connected to my family and keep that up there. And then you can set a goal for a million dollars in sales. But as you achieve that, keep looking to say, am I getting why I'm doing this? Right. I, I think that's great advice. Um, I'm curious, Peter, uh, how do you start your day? Do you have a set routine? Well, it depends on how generous um, my wife is uh -huh. because um, Eleanor is super generous. You know, you've, you've read about her in the book. Exactly. And she's, you know, super generous. And, you know, if I'm, if I'm going to sleep late or if I have a late dinner or something and I'm exhausted and um, then sometimes I can sleep a little later, but the kids are really, you know, up at six 30 and we're getting them out. I, my ideal is to wake up and meditate for 20 minutes. Right. And sometimes I just have to wake up a little earlier to make that happen, but to wake up and meditate for 20 minutes and, uh, and, and to really kind of set the stage for the rest of my day. And then, uh, to, you know, again, my ideal is to be out there eating breakfast with my kids and then either Eleanor or I will take them down to the bus. Today um, happened to be a day in which I took my daughter to school uh, and there was something going on in my son's classroom. So I did that. And then I come back and it depends on whether I'm you know, with clients that day or whether I'm writing. Or, but that's generally how we start. And I always get a workout in somewhere during the day. So if it's not first thing in the morning, it's, you know, it's sometime soon. Let's skip to uh, the third part of your book, Four Seconds, uh, which is optimize your work habits. And, and I'd like you to address uh, a constant issue uh, in many organizations, and that's complainers. Hmm. Yeah, you know, people complain a lot about complainers, don't they? Yeah, they sure do. Right. Um, <laughs> so, you know, that in and of itself is interesting, isn't it? But, but the, you know, what I say is there's two general ways we tend to deal with complainers, right? One is to complain with them, right? And to, to agree with them. And now we're gossiping in the hall about how terrible that leader is or whatever it is, how much work we have. The second is to argue with them, right? And to say, you know, it's really not that bad and think about the good. I'm sorry you just broke up with your boyfriend, but there's so many other people out there. And, you know, I mean, it could be a work setting. It could be a non-work setting, but, but um, we try to make them feel better, which ultimately is arguing with them, right? It's telling them here, you shouldn't feel what you're feeling. And let me tell you why, so that you cheer up. We do that, by the way, we talked about emotional courage. We do that because we don't want to feel the sadness for them, or we don't want to feel, you know, like we've contributed to their problem. You know, there's things we don't want to feel, so we respond in those ways. Um, I guess there's a third thing that we can do, because we could join them in a funny kind of way, which I, I sort of joked about before, which is, which is that we can complain about the complainers, in which case we've just become complainers to other people. Right. So, um, so what I suggest is don't feed it and don't contradict it. If you feed it and you contradict it, both will increase the complaining. So the first thing is, what's the outcome you want, right? Do you want to stop the complaining? Do you want to learn from what they're upset about? Like, that's the first thing. Always the first thing is, what's the outcome you're going for? Right. It's always the first question. So let's say, like, really what you want is for everybody to get back to work. You're not going to solve their problems. You're not going to, you want to get back to work and you want them to get back to work. In some way, but you also want to turn around their attitude. Right? Let's say you want to, because if you want to get back to work, it's very easy. You just look at them and you say, that sounds really hard. I'm really sorry. And I hope it gets better. And you move on. Right. But if you want to turn around their attitude, which as leaders is what we have to do. You know, I mean, we're all in, in leadership roles having to shift people's attitudes. And at that point, I think what you want to do is you want to listen to them enough to understand like what they're least negative about, what their what their complaint is that might be slightly positive, the good side. Oftentimes, people will say, you know, on the bright side, um, and and I would, you know, acknowledge the stuff that they're really having a hard time with, and then and this is subtle. Acknowledge what they're complaining about. Always do that because then that affirms it for them. They feel heard, and they don't have to continue. 
right? If you argue with them, they're going to feel like you don't hear them and they're going to have to keep saying it over and over and over again. So you acknowledge what it is that they've said. And then you, in effect, reward them for the positive thing. You know, you sort of say, I'll give you an example. I'll give you a totally gross example. All right. And this is just my life, but it's a gross example. And it's got to do with home life, not work life. But you'll get the feel for it. So my daughter, Sophia, nine years old, was, um, long story short, she was sick. And I went up to get a pail for her. I told you it was going to be gross. I went up to get a pail for her. And she um, vomited in her bed before I got there. Right? All right. And, and this tells you a little bit about Sophia's uh, personality uh, and her disposition. So literally, and this is the gross part, I'm sorry, but literally, you know, Daniel, my seven-year-old, meets me at the door and says, too late, you know, as I'm coming up there with the pail. And <laughs> I'm and sure she, he was totally excited about yeah, this whole thing. He too. Was yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, too late, too late. And she was literally sitting in a pool of vomit. Like she was sitting in a pool of vomit. And, and, and okay, I'm going to go one step grosser. I'm going to, you know, just keep going. She literally had like vomit dripping down, right? Like she's a kid who's just vomited in her bed. And she looks up at me. And she says, I promise you, this is what happened. This is the thing that she said. She looks up at me and she goes, on the bright side, I feel a lot better. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> right? And it's like, it's like you really want to get to that point. Right. It's an amazing, beautiful point. You got to get to, I don't know that I would have been at that point. But she actually felt better because, you know, when, you, when you're sick and you get sick, then you feel better afterwards. And, and it's kind of like, it's kind of like, I'm really sorry you feel so terrible. And what an amazing thing that you just had that approach. That given all of this, given that you vomited in your bed, which is basically what complainers are doing, given that, that you're at the same time able to say, you know what, though, I feel a lot better now that that's happened. And I think when you combine those two things, and I hope now this will be indelibly marked. <laughs> yeah. Now, this, this lesson will be indelibly marked in every viewer's, you know, head and memory and for better or worse but it's like acknowledge what's happened and and congratulate and and connect with like the 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 positivity that comes out of them and they'll feel good about that and they'll move on peter what what advice do you give uh those folks who are just starting out in their careers uh who want to become leaders you know what i would say is don't wait to be a leader just be a leader you know, leadership, the way I define leadership is people who are willing and able and they step powerfully into their lives, like people who step powerfully into their lives to, you know, pursue ambitious goals that they want to make happen in the world. And, and that is leadership. And leadership doesn't have to be, I'm at the head of an organization. I mean, I can't tell you how many organizations have profited deeply from leadership in the junior ranks and in the middle ranks and people who, you know, I, I mean, I, there's a bank that was completely saved by a sort of junior mid-level guy who saw something about risk in real estate that no, a very big bank that, that no one else saw. And within a half a day, he was sitting in the CEO's office and he explained what he saw. And within a month, they had rid themselves of most of their uh, holdings that would have made them vulnerable in the real estate market. And, and it's like leadership, leadership, I, and I used to, you know what, I mean, I'll talk about the leadership intensive. It's coming up, by the way, which is why it's in my mind. But um, I used to have a, a, a level at which I accepted people. I used to say, you know what, this is a leadership intensive. It's for senior leaders. And I only want people who are CEOs or direct reports to the CEOs. And, and then people started applying who weren't there. And I looked at them and I interviewed them. And I said, you know, this person is showing really deep leadership in their lives. And they're not, uh, and they don't have a particular title. And I was wrong. I was wrong to sort of create this line that says, oh, I'm only going to teach leadership to these people who are really in quote unquote leadership roles. I was wrong about that. And I think that, you know, so what I would say is see yourself as a powerful actor in the world. Look for opportunities to step more fully into your life make mistakes, make more mistakes, get feedback no matter what it looks like, and step powerfully into every experience that you have. And your leadership will continue to grow in profound ways, and you'll make a really powerful impact in the world. One last question for you. What, what did you learn 
in writing this book or what surprised you as an outcome of writing this book that you weren't expecting? You know, I, I what I want to say, and this was true of 18 Minutes and it was true of Point B, right? My previous two books. Mm-hmm. Um, I never, and I hope this doesn't come out uh, arrogant, because I because I don't feel it that way. I feel like I write a book, and I like my book when I write it. I mean, I like it. I I feel like it's a good book, but I don't think for any of these books I understand the importance of the book until after it's been published. Meaning. I write it and I think it's good and I don't know about this. I don't know that I like this or that. And I think it's good and I think people will enjoy it and I think it's a good read and I think it can be helpful. But when I start talking to people who read it and when I start having these conversations, right, like with you and with all the you know radio interviews that I do, and I begin to start talking about it and I begin to understand like, wow, this idea of a moment of awareness, a moment of awareness before jumping into what we want to do, even if that a moment of awareness is a second or two, that's enough time to recognize I'm about to do something. I want to make a judgment as to whether it's the right thing. And then to build our capacity to resist our urges, like that skill of resisting the urge to jump into the move I would have made is actually really a, a, a second to none in terms of importance uh, of, of being able to act powerfully in the world and then to choose a replacement behavior that's more productive. So I think I, I, I only really begin to understand how important I feel like my books are after I've done all the work and after I've put them out and after I start talking to people about them and I see the impact that it ends up having on people. Peter, how can people connect with you? So you can always go to peterbregman.com, P-E-T-E-R-B-R-E-G-M-A-N.com. And there's all the, you know, you can, there's contact there. There's lots of information, lots of videos and articles, and um, you can connect with me there. Thank you so much for taking time to speak with us today here on Total Picture. I've really enjoyed our conversation. I did too. It's such a pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me on.